Um, our last speaker is Dr. Marcus King. Dr. King is John O. Rankin Associate Professor of International Affairs and Director of George Washington University's Master of Arts in International Affairs program. Dr. King joined the Elliott School in 2011 from the research staff of the Center for Naval Analyses Corporation, where he directed studies on climate security, resilience, and adaptation. He was also a project director for the CNA Military Advisory Board. An elite group of retired admirals and generals constituted to provide recommendations and reports on how these topics affect U.S. national security. From 2003 to 2006, Dr. King was research director of the Sustainable Energy Institute and senior manager for energy and security programs at a private consultancy. During the administration of President William Clinton, he held presidential appointments in the office of the Secretary of Defense, where he represented the United States for negotiation of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, and the office of the Secretary of Energy, where he participated in negotiations on the peaceful uses of nuclear energy with the Russian Federation. Dr. King is a member of the Center for Climate and Security's Advisory Board. His present research focuses on identifying ties between water scarcity and large-scale violence. Thank you very much. Um, are you able to see my presentation? Yeah. Excellent. Thanks. Um, so I, I'm, what I'm going to do is present some of my research. And what that does is it really illustrates some of the um, many scenarios of climate change and conflict that were brought up by Dr. Blaine, um, but certainly as it relates to water. So this is a um, multi-year project I have worked on. Um, for about four years now um, that has to do with the water weaponization. And so these are just a few of the publications that I had. So my first had to do with um, water weaponization in the context of Syria and Iraq and how that was done by the sub-state actor ISIS. Um, also the water and security and US foreign policy, I had a later chapter on weaponization of water and water conflict in Nigeria. And so what I've done now is I've rounded this out with some work on Somalia and Al-Shabaab. And so the way that the project has worked is that I looked at the worst period of an in instrumental record of drought in these three nations, which was 2011 to 2016, roughly. Um, and so here, I wanted to mention that all of these case studies are within the greater Middle East and North African area. Um, and so what I've done is I've just illustrated some of the impacts, the cumulative impacts of climate change that affect this area. Um, you can see the global land aridity index is very high. So not only are there cyclical droughts, but it's a very arid region generally. Um, there's also the potential of, you know, up to a foot of sea level rise by the end of the century, um, perhaps even more. But generally in terms of adaptation and resilience to climate change, these countries are um, the most challenged of probably any region. So I wanted to talk a little bit about water conflict and what the sources of water conflict are. But first I would note, um, some research was done in the, at the University of Oregon, something called the Transboundary Freshwater Dispute Database. And what this database did is it looked back 500 years back to Mesopotamia which was um, what we refer to as a hydraulic civilization. Um, looking back 2,500 years, it cataloged all the instances of water cooperation that had occurred between nations, and then what were the times where there was water conflict. And so what it found was that cooperation over water issues, um, allocation of waters between transboundary actors, overwhelmingly um, exceeded the amount of times there was conflict. Um, by a factor of even like 50 to one or so. Um, but what I propose is that under certain conditions, we're beginning to see how this is changing and, and maybe how it will change. <clears throat> so some of the factors that, that build toward potential conflict over water resources are unilateral infrastructure development. And what I mean by that is dams, dams that are constructed by countries, usually what we call the upper riparian in a river system, they're um, constructed by countries without consultations of the lower riparians, of the countries that are further down in that river system. 
um, rapid changes in precipitation within a country, accelerated now by climate change, are other drivers of, of conflict um, and, and food insecurity. Weak social institutions have to do with essentially water governance. So countries that are already um, in conflictual situations, countries that are poor, countries that lack scientific capabilities, um, have a weaker ability to um, implement good water policies. Um, existing animosities within a country um, that may have originally had to do with water, but are more likely religious differences, differences between rich and poor, um, differences in tribal affiliation. When these are underlying factors, it's more likely there will be conflict over water. Um, and then finally, climate change. So climate change is acting, I believe, as a catalyst where we will see more conflict over water just because of an atmosphere of scarcity of that resource. Um, and so one of these places where this is playing itself out and could play itself out further is in Egypt and the Nile River system, including Sudan and Ethiopia. Um, what we're seeing here in this region is that the Nile River Delta, which is the most fertile area, along with this thin section you see on the slide, um, that the very narrow area adjacent to the Nile are the only fertile regions within Egypt. E Egypt is reliant on <clears throat> over 96% of its water intake from beyond its borders. So you have this unilateral infrastructure development problem, but then you've got climate change now as, as a, um, an element that's been introducing itself even more rapidly. So sea level rise at, um, has been flooding the delta, that saline intrusion into the, the planting, um, into the soil. The desert's been encroaching due to the um, desertification, increasing desertification. Um, and then you've got this um, issue of the, the dam being built upstream. And so that's also reducing the flow in the water. And it's also allowing saline intrusion further up in, into the water. Um, and so I had the opportunity in 2019 to further develop this scenario um, in, in Abu Dhabi at the Emirates Diplomatic Academy, where we did a scenario exercise with diplomats from 40 countries, um, particularly from the region. Um, and we found that as the rounds of the game moved on, there was not um, institutional capability within the countries involved to deal with these problems, which included migration, um, but also the regional institutions were insufficient. And so we did something called a hot wash at the end of the scenario exercise which we call the peace game, not a war game. Um, and you know what we got was the reaction of the players. And there was a gentleman who was the former prime minister, um, yeah, uh, defense minister of Egypt, who was involved in what he had said that the most unrealistic factor was that I had predicted by 2030, there would be 3 million environmental refugees. And he thought it would be greatly higher, you know, even 30 million if a scenario like this were to play itself out, essentially due to food insecurity and the food price shocks that had developed. So I wanna talk a little bit more about that situation. <clears throat> so there's a concept called hydrohegemony, and what that really refers to is the manipulation of water, using water as a political tool of leverage by the countries that are further up in the river system. So where we see this self playing itself out, and this was um, alluded to also by Dr. Blaine, um, is in the Mekong and, and certain other river systems. And, and so what happened two years ago in the Mekong was there was a period of intense drought. Um, and what this did was it reduced the flow of the river. You can sort of see in this, this illustration here from two years ago. And it also reduced um, the volume of a hydrological rate, lake called the Tonlesap, which was the key to food security in Cambodia and, and also parts of Laos. Um, and as you see, there is um, upstream, you know, the red and the yellow circles and, and, and the um, teal circles. These are all dams that are either completed or proposed um, with Chinese finance. And so the Chinese have dams within their own borders where they're able to cut off the flow of the river. They needed to do so probably also due to dry conditions, but also they're investing through their Belt and Road Initiative in infrastructure in countries that are continuing to harm the lower riparians. And so this is the idea of hydrohegemony, of being able to um, monopolize water resources at the state level. But my research really had to do with how that happens at the sub-state level. 
So a book that I have under review, um, should be returning from the publishers very soon, is called The Water Weapon, um, Water and Extremism in the Middle East and North Africa. So I looked at these three case studies that I had already mentioned, Syria in Iraq, Northern Nigeria, and Somalia, and the focal extremist group that weaponized water were these groups here. So I found that water could be weaponized by sub-state actors, these extremist groups, in essentially six ways. Um, I won't go through them all, but I'll mention some of the highlights. So at the strategic level, water was used to destroy important areas or infrastructure or to affect broad populations. And this was especially relevant to the situation in the civil war in, in Iraq and Syria. Um, in 2014, ISIS seized the Mosul Dam and what they did was that allowed them to threaten to blow it up, which they didn't do. But what it did was it gave them a control over a virtual territory that was very vast. And so if they were to blow up the, the, um, the dam, what it would have done is release a wave of water that could have traveled 150 kilometers down the Tigris and, and wipe out what was known as the green zone. And so what this did was it precipitated um, airstrikes by the Obama administration where they helped their Kurdish allies to move um, ISIS off of that dam. So strategic weaponization uh, within a context of a conflict is similar to this idea of hydro hegemony, but also water can be used as a weapon on as a tactical means. And this is something that, uh, um, you know, has been fairly traditional. It might be blowing up dikes or levees. It might be flooding areas to deny access by troops. There was a situation unfolding in Ukraine, for example, um, where marshes near Kiev were flooded um, to deny that from the Russians being able to take over. Um, Coercive weaponization is when an extremist group manipulates water um, to either gain allegiance from a subjugated population or to raise taxes for their military efforts. Um, and of course, it can be used as purely a, a tool of terrorism, which it can happen when um, cities are laid siege to and then water is denied. So these were the th six ways that I saw water being weaponized, but all of this has to do, again, with the worst droughts in instrumental record in these three countries, all occurring in a situation where it was between um, a, a, you know, a very short amount of time. So moving on then, I wanted to um, dig a little deeper into the Syrian example. And in Syria, I recognized, um, I've developed this idea of something called the water stress and conflict cycle. And I'll come back to this later in another context. Um, but what we had here was the direct physical impacts of climate change, such as drought, desertification, temperature rise, which then had an effect on what I would call human systems, which was a reduction in agricultural productivity, um, reduction in the food system, food became more scarce. And so one of the human responses here was migration. Many people became internally displaced people. Um, and what happened was these farmers moved to the periphery of cities um, in, in the northern part of Syria, where, um, of course, the, the reason for moving had to do with poverty, um, as it frequently does. And not all environmental migration is negative, because sometimes it is the best, um, what we call autonomous adaptation technique that can relieve um, some of the pressure, some of the economic pressure. But it was, ar arguably, climate change was a, a big driver because the drought reduced um, the food stocks and the, the wheat harvest and what was available. And so what we found was that um, farmers were relegated to the periphery of cities um, where there were, were these existing underlying animosities um, in the context of Syria. You had the Alawite majority of which Assad is a member that discriminated against um, these Sunni farmers who had moved to that area. And so to make a long story short, one of those cities was Dara. Um, and Dara was where we saw the outbreak of the, the Syrian civil war. So there were military aged men who were economically disadvantaged and they joined different sides in the Syrian civil war, not necessarily ISIS, but there is um, connections to radicalism there. So we, we found that um, subnational groups within the context of the war, as opposed to say the Syrian government or the Russians, um, were the ones that weaponized water at a greater um, rate. And so that was just one of our findings. <clears throat> but we drew some um, 
some of the implications from this. And I'd already mentioned that water weaponization was significant because it precipitated the U.S. airstrikes and more U.S. direct involvement on the ground. And that the water weapon was a critical enabler of ISIS and their um, holistic war campaign and their designs to become a, you know, a viable state. Um, and denying the ability of ISIS to um, manipulate this water weapon could be an effective part of counterinsurgency. Um, when it comes to Nigeria and Somalia, the issues were different. Um, in Nigeria, there was um, desiccation or the shrinking of Lake Chad, which lost 90% of its volume since the late 60s, um, which created a situation of famine and again, mass migration in that area. So those who had migrated that were internally displaced people in camps had diminished resilience to attacks by Boko Haram. Um, and so that was the situation there. And then in Somalia, um, I would say that the use of water, the water weapon had backfired. And this was the sense that al-Shabaab in their um, design at that point to build a state in Somalia refused both food supplies and water assistance into the areas that they controlled. Um, and, you know, this blew up in, in their faces. And um, they learned during the next drought period um, in, in the late in about 2019 to, to not do this, and they then provided water, you know, becoming the, the um, what was seen more as the legitimate government at that point. So I wanted to get back to this idea of the water stress and conflict cycle to speak a little bit more about the role of science. And so this is another example where we see water stressors in the middle belt of Nigeria. Um, the outcomes there also had to do with altering um, ancestral migratory patterns between the farmers and the herders in that region. Um, the herds, herders were encroaching upon the land of the pastoralists. The pastoralists happened to be Christian. The herders were Fulani, which are a Muslim group. Um, and the idea of um, the competition for natural resources and water led to violent conflict there as well. And when there is this sort of background of conflict within a given geography, it becomes impossible to implement um, effective water management policies. So we've got water stressors, these systemic outcomes, the responses, and then the conflict effects. And what this does within environmental security analysis is it, pre it um, presents a challenge. And this challenge I call the problem of transdisciplinarity. And that's because to understand primary climate impacts, that brings into a, um, in the play scientific specializations such as meteorology, earth science, um, geophysics. It relates to the global circulation models for climate change that have to be interpreted. Um, then looking at some of the ecological impacts, you might, you know, um, botany, biology might come into play. Understanding the societal impacts, these impacts on human systems, you have um, um, ecological economics, looking at the valuation of natural capital, you have political science and demographers. And then finally, to understand the, um, the, the end game of the impacts of climate change on human built systems, that could be, again, economics or engineering. And where the, the challenge lies is that many organizations are not, there are, there are very few organizations that are able to integrate um, specialists who are involved in all these different areas of sciences and political science into one unit or into one area. So in the intelligence community, that's been an issue. Um, but it's also an issue in academia um, because these people would be coming from different departments, from different disciplines. Um, and so rarely are they brought together in a cohesive way that would allow sort of soup to nuts analysis of climate change impacts in, in a given geography. So this is the challenge um, of, of bringing people like this together. Um, so um, finishing up here, I had a few um, observations and, and recommendations about how to combat, or as I say, stem the tide of climate, um, <clears throat> sorry, of water weaponization. And this, so this involves the three Ds, the three levers of US foreign policy, which are defense, development, and diplomacy. Um, so in, in the defense world, it's incorporating regional water stress information into strategies to counter violent extremism. So this is the counterinsurgency piece. In terms of development, though, which I think is the most important um, aspect of um, ways that can be brought to bear to 
combat water weaponization. And that's really investment in climate adaptation projects in countries that are water stressed. And some of this can be done through the mechanisms of the Paris Accord called climate finance. Some of it can be done by um, unilateral development assistance from groups like USAID, um, which I might talk about more in, in the Q&A. Um, and then diplomatic efforts, because um, due to the laws of war, um, the deliberate destruction of civilian infrastructure violates the Geneva Conventions. It violates another convention called the Environmental Modification Treaty, where you cannot modify the environment um, as a technique of waging war. So these together are all instruments that a country like the United States could employ to stem the tide of water weaponization. But particularly for science agencies, there are capacities that are resident in the United States, especially in government, um, also in, in the academic sector, university sector, um, where better information from satellites and remote sensing platforms could be brought to bear to um, provide better hydrological data to countries that are undergoing water disputes, whether that's countries or at the subnational level, um, the, the amount of water held by countries um, you know, for example, looking at the Indus River Treaty from the 1960s, that was the last time that a comprehensive assessment of the hydrological holdings of each country had been done. So these need to be updated, and countries that are involved in negotiations need to understand what the water resources are. And this is the place where science agencies and other groups in the United States who have um, some of these capacities could um, intervene and, and be able to make a real difference on the ground. So... That's all I have um, for now, and I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you.